Good morning. This is a response to a video by Suicide for Celluloid, which is in turn a response to a video by Skeptical Heretic and a few other people. Hi there. Hope you don't mind me jumping into this conversation, guys. I noticed it's something that Thunderfoot was also recently talking about. It's uh, to do with the internet and uh, how this public conversation might be best facilitated, continued, allowed to flourish with some degree of protection around it and, and something like free speech uh, or protected speech associated with it at least and what the effects of, um, of things like blocking might be. Uh, I just made a couple of notes here. The, 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 what you said there, you're talking a little bit about trolling there, suicide for celluloid. And it is an interesting phenomenon. You're talking about it being a relatively recent phenomenon. It only comes about with the age of the internet and I think that's true. Um, I guess it's to do with barriers for entry, isn't that? You know. Uh, I guess there's always been people who wanted to, dis to disrupt various public conversations that have taken place, but it's always been a bit difficult, hasn't it? Um, whether that be because of well, because of barriers to entry, you know, whether that be an authorised public conversation taking place in a forum or in a in the Houses of Parliament here in the UK or wherever it might take place, that's just gaining access to places requires a lot of commitment and potential risk, whereas of course busting a conversation on the internet is, is as easy as making an account. So uh, the, the, the physical barriers for entry are much lower, um, which I think is good and bad, isn't it? Because on the one hand, it level, levels the playing field, and we always say a level playing field is a good thing, and I think it is for most of the time. But you know, one level playing fields are useful sometimes. Hierarchies are useful. We associate hierarchies, I think, with negatives, and they can be. And certainly, hierarchies of whether they be knowledge hierarchies or power hierarchies, they are. They, they, there are many examples of them being negative because they are exclusionary, they can be associated with income, they can be associated with just being born in the right place at the right time, they can be associated with um, aristocracies, you know, these kind of hierarchies, uh, creating inequities in access to knowledge and power is, is problematic. But there are good hierarchies, aren't they? You know, hierarchies of commitment. It, 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 it should be the case that a public conversation that's been advanced by people who are committed to that conversation, who have spent a long time in that conversation, who've thrashed out a lot of things, who've done the research, it seems um, fitting that that conversation should be protected from intrusions by people who haven't, either haven't done the research, aren't committed to the discussion as, it, as it's proceeded up to this point, or whose intention are, are simply to derail. Um, or, or, or for egotistical reasons, you know, regardless of what the subject of that conversation is, the um, that would apply to the conversations on 4chan B as much as they would apply to the conversations that take place in more kind of philosophically driven uh, academic kind of conversations. Um, yeah, so there's something there to do with about about trolling and the, and the lowering of barriers to entry into the public conversation. And if we do like the idea of public conversation, and I'm, I'm, I'm a great fan of it, then um, what can we do to ensure that it's uh, you know, organised in a way which creates hierarchies or levels of commitment to that conversation without um, creating hierarchies of power or other, other forms of, of hierarchy which aren't useful. Okay, the second thing I want to just briefly talk about is to do with the public square. Uh, Thunderfoot recently described the internet, and YouTube in particular, as a kind of public square. Therefore, blocking on the public square is, is, is the equivalent to knocking someone off their soapbox, those kind of things. And, and there's a lot to be said about that kind of thing. But the important thing is, of course, that the public square, for the most part, isn't public, is it? The public square is privately owned. All of these spaces that we carry out the public conversation within are owned by corporations and um, you, you don't have to be any kind of anti-corporate activist to recognize that there might be problems there. Corporations are inherently driven by the bottom line and um, and that has effects, doesn't it? It has effects on not just on what kind of content is finds its way into that public conversation. It, it pretty much has to be content which is not off-putting to advertisers but also the actual structure and the form that that public conversation is, is begins to take is mediated by the platform that the corporations build in this corporately owned public square. So features like blocking, features like um, liking and disliking on YouTube. Um, I think YouTube is probably 
That's the only one of the systems I know that actually has an, a, a, a dislike button on it. You know, the fact that the likes are visible and dislikes are not visible. You know, all of the kind of architecture of, um, of you know, the kind of architecture that, that steers behavior in these, in these corporately owned public spaces has an effect and, and, and organizes the public conversation in particular ways and, and facilitates certain forms of interaction, group formation and uh, social structuring and um, disadvantages other forms. So the fact that the public square is public is important because the form that the public square is taking isn't really a form that's designed for conversation, it's designed for ultimately for um, marketing and so on. Okay, so but the other thing you, want, you talked about was the fact that we are a medium in evolution, and I think that's really in, in, interesting and important. You know, the, the internet's only been going for 20 years or so, hasn't it? So, uh, uh, less than that. So, it's, um, it is a medium in evolution, and that's, that's really significant. One of the changes that I'm seeing, I've seen over the last five years or so, perhaps longer, is a shift towards a much more intermedial way of working. You know, most people I know these days aren't, apart from myself actually, aren't really content on one platform. We, uh, we define ourselves not according to our, our YouTube profile or our Facebook uh, profile, but according to a set of profiles, set of aspects that, that, are, that face outwards from all these different platforms. You know, most people are, operate relatively smoothly between Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr and YouTube and, and all the rest, and, um, and no single platform cuts it. So I think that's that's there's some uh, redundancy in that some I think there's a bit of robustness in the fact that people tend to move across platforms now and uh, and exist um, kind of strung between these platforms there used to be that there was a few years ago there was a book by Shelley Turkle called um, identity in the age of the internet it was one of those kind of seminal books that was written in the early days of, of, uh, of people going online and what identity would be like and she was talking about people having different identities in different spaces and that, that was how people talked about it then it was when you know on the internet no one knows you're a dog it was when a lot of that kind of stuff was popular and people would and she would she would she claimed that you know people who had different windows open on their desktop uh, were different people in those different domains and there's, a, there's certainly a truth in that but i think a more realistic appraisal of how we people operate now is that people as i say are kind of strung between different or are defined by their appearance between different kind of outlets different aspects you know you have an aspect of your personality on facebook a slightly different one on tumblr a slightly different one on twitter and so on and um, when we get to know one another increasingly not through a single screen but through a, a kind of understanding or an intuition of of that of the the rounded person that is available behind all those different aspects that's just my speculation that seems to be one of the ways in which the the medium is evolving in terms of how we function within the medium towards more intermediality and toward the construction of denizens of the internet which are um, defined by that by the way that they're described in these different aspects uh, I think another aspect of that and, and related to that really is the is the fact that people are migratory and nomadic within these different spaces you know the little um, what are sometimes called temporary autonomous zones tend to form you know spaces of of localized temporary freedoms uh, where speech is temporarily available temporarily protected and then move on you know I think we see that with people moving across different platforms and uh, you know, different video hosting sites being popular for a while, different forum sites being popular for a while, and then the conversations kind of moving on. When as that as one becomes closed down, and I mean by closed down, I mean either closed down because of um, you know literal closure, like the recent closure of Stickham, or um, or just a kind of a, a kind of popularity, a, 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 a rendering useless by overpopularity, in which you know sites become so colonised by other kinds of conversation that. that the, or that certain conversations can't happen so um, you know a migratory nomadic population that moves between different outlets different aspects of those things is is one of the evolutionary processes that I think we're seeing underway here which is also very interesting uh, certainly just to close really and this is a kind of wish list one of the things that I'd like to see and that I've argued for in the videos many times is you know within that general move I think towards general evolution towards intermedial um, media use towards the uh, identification of temporary autonomous zones towards um, you know nomadic 
uh, redefinitions of oneself strung between different platforms. Uh, within all of that, I'd certainly like to see more use of open source and um, uh, yeah, just yeah, open source, publicly available, non-corporate owned media. I, I do think it's a shame that that's not that's not as popular as it as it is because it gives us so much more protection. I think, and I suppose I'm thinking of things like Indica rather than Twitter or um, Diaspora rather than Facebook. Um, and of course, an increasing use of peer-to-peer uh, of -peer technology. I don't know why peer-to-peer -peer hasn't taken off to the extent it should for this kind of public conversation. It's still just used for file sharing mostly, isn't it? But things like Tribbler, which are distributed models, uh, I think are much more effective potentially for um, yeah, maintaining public conversations, really, notwithstanding the, the potential problems of those things. Um, yeah, because it seems to me if there is going to be a public square, it isn't, an, it isn't a centralised public square, it's a distributed public square in which we all, we all have it. You know, we, have, we have the public square ourselves, um, and it's distributed across every person who wants to contribute to the public conversation. That's, that seems like the way to go, and by that I mean at, at the level of the tools, the software, the infrastructure, and, 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 and everything really. So mesh networks, um, peer-to-peer software, um, open source clients, all that kind of stuff really. So uh, yeah, interesting stuff. Thanks very much for that. Hope you don't mind me butting in and um, goodbye.